Welcome to the interview, I'm Marcus Carlson. Today I'm sitting down with the well-known economist Joseph Stiglitz. He's got a rock-solid CV and to say so almost seems like an understatement. He won the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001. He also used to be the chief economist at the World Bank as well as an advisor to US President uh, Bill Clinton on economic policy now. He's a professor at Columbia University in New York, and in, he, he's here in Paris to promote his uh, recent book, The Great Divide, Unequal Societies and What We Can Do About Them, which is uh, just coming out in French as well. Uh, welcome to the program, first of all, and thank you for speaking to us. Nice to be here. Now, global stock markets have had a pretty rough ride in recent weeks, and it seems to be coming from concerns that global growth is slowing down, and especially from concerns that growth in China is slowing down. How worried should we be? Uh, a little bit, but not a lot. We all expected China's growth to slow down. It was moving from a, you might say, the quantity to quality. Mm -hmm. It needed to reform its growth model as it went from export-led growth to domestically demand-driven growth. But are they actually doing that? Are they moving from quantity yes. to quality? Uh, Yes, uh, but slower than many people had hoped. Uh, but they are moving. But we have this landscape where we're seeing sluggish growth in, in, in China, we're seeing sluggish growth in Brazil, even in Canada. Recession. Exactly, a recession in Brazil, but also, as I say, in other countries, like, like in Canada, which obviously is dependent on, on oil prices. But we're now seven or eight years after the financial crisis. Wasn't this the time when we were supposed to see a stronger global economy? Uh, and I think that's testimony to the fact that we didn't do what we should have done to put us on robust growth. What should we it, have done? Well, we should have recognized that the global economy, the American economy, was sick before the 2008 crisis. What, uh, was the source of growth before the crisis was a bubble, bubbles in Spain, bubbles in, in the United States. Why did we have those bubbles? In part, the central banks engineered the bubbles in order to make up for the deficiency in overall demand. What were the reasons for the deficiencies in aggregate demand? A complicated set of forces, but one of those is the growing inequality. When people at the top consume less than those people in the bottom. So when you have this growing inequality, you're going to have a weak economy unless you offset it somehow. And before the crisis, we set it, offset it by a bubble. Now we've ended the bubble, but we haven't put anything in its place. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not a surprise at all that we've had this very tepid recovery. Now, you're seen as one of the world's greatest thinkers when it comes to inequality and the battle against it. Why have you chosen to dedicate so much of your career to, to inequality? Well, it's actually why I entered economics in the first place. I grew up in Gary, Indiana, which is an industrial town in the southern tip of, of Lake Michigan. And as I was growing up, I saw inequality all around me. You know, people were saying the great American economy, uh, how it was uh, creating all this prosperity. And what I saw as I was growing up was discrimination, inequality, poverty, uh, the classmates, uh, my, the parents of my classmates episodically were unemployed as the economy went through its ups and downs. It wasn't this picture of the golden age of capitalism that I, I was reading about. But it was still a time when inequalities were actually lessening. Well, however. that's exactly the point. It was, that was better than it was today. And I was very, <laughs> when I entered economics, I entered because I thought we ought to be creating a, a fairer society, a more equal society. And unfortunately, what I've seen in the subsequent half century, and it's been actually 50 years since I began teaching, uh, what I've seen is a growth, a disturbing growth in inequality. Do you think that the lessening of inequality in the post-war era, was that a parenthesis of history? As you say, now we're heading in the other direction. Uh, I think... I hope it's not a parenthesis in history. Uh, there is a debate about why there was this uh, short period after World War II 
that there was this decrease in inequality. Uh, some people think it was an aberration of capitalism and that we are going back to normal capitalism with this growth in inequality. My view is that we were actually creating a well-functioning capitalist system and we had to make it better functioning. And what happened beginning in around 1980 with Reagan, Thatcher, was that we began rewriting the rules of the market economy to give more power to the people at the top, lower taxes at the top. Is that you, where the inequality that we're seeing today started? Uh, very much so. It's very, very clear in the data. And what we now need to do is rewrite the rules again to make not only a shared prosperity, but greater prosperity. You speak there of rewriting the rules, and there is a lot of talk uh, about rewriting those rules. President Obama, for instance, said ahead of his, or in connection with his second term starting, that that would be one of the themes of his presidency, of what was left of it. Still, though, there's a lot of talk, not a lot of action by the looks of things. Why do you think the leap between words and action is so difficult? In the United States, it's precisely because of the influence of money. Uh, and unfortunately, a, a real democratic deficit. You know, uh, Congress is controlled by, uh, by the Republicans, many of whom are very conservative, even though more people voted for Democratic congressmen than voted for Republican, a million more. Mm -hmm. So we have gerrymandering, we have a system that allows a minority to have a majority of votes in Congress. And uh, the combination of that gerrymandering, uh, a system of, of money in politics, has made change very difficult. I'm guessing there's no silver bullet when it comes to inequality and the fight against it. But if there was one policy, that, that, that you would like to see that would do something about it, what would it be? I suppose if there were just one policy, education is the most important because uh, it's not only the overall quantity, but it's equal access to education. You used to work for, for Bill Clinton. Will you vote then for his wife in the upcoming presidential election? Is Hillary Clinton the, the one person who can do something about this? Uh, if Hillary is the nominee of the Democratic Party, uh, uh, I almost cer certainly would. I mean, obviously, I would like to see who the Republican, but we've already seen who the candidates are, and there's not a single one of them that is proposing an agenda that would do anything significant about the country's inequality. And most of them are proposing uh, uh, ideas that would actually increase inequality and slow economic growth. I want to turn to another topic. Uh briefly and finally, uh, Greece and its third bailout. You have been pretty critical of the way that the third bailout for Greece looks. W why is that? Well, it's a continuation of the failed policies. The, the, uh, Greece is, is in depression. Uh, GDP is down 25% from what it was before the crisis. Uh, uh, unemployment is at 25%. Youth unemployment is at 50%. And all of this is largely because Greece did what it was told to do, mm -hmm. not because it didn't do what it was told to do. The, the magnitudes of the austerity that has been imposed uh, have been devastating on the economy. Now, some austerity was inevitable. They couldn't, didn't have access to international markets. But Europe has gone well beyond what was necessary. They are now demanding that Greece have primary surpluses mm -hmm. of three and a half percent. And those kinds of primary surpluses that led to the depression in, in Germany and predictably are, would lead to a depression in any country. There's now a debate on, on whether or not Greece's debts are sustainable. You have said that uh, the program, the third bailout, will lead to unsustainable levels of debt. Would debt relief put the Greek economy uh, on the right track? Well, first, there is no debate. Every economist who's looked at the issue, the IMF, says Greek debt is not sustainable. There has to be a restructuring. 
whether you call it a restructuring or you call it a reprofiling, isn't important. The mm -hmm. point is, it, it can't pay. But a debt restructuring without a reduction in the primary surplus will not put them back on growth. So you need a debt restructuring, but you also need to reduce the primary surplus. And what's your outlook then for the Greek economy, if we look ahead? Uh, well, it's not only my outlook, it's what the IMF says. The depression is going to get deeper and it's going to last longer. So this program is not a growth it's not a recovery program. It's consigning Greece to ever deeper depression uh, with really no hope in sight. The only hope is that eventually Europe, Germany sees some compassion, some sense of solidarity, and changes the program. That's what the Greeks are betting on. I think that's what anybody who believes that, uh, hopes that the euro will... And what does that mean, a change in the program? Well, it means uh, changing the primary surplus of 3.5% to a more reasonable number of 1%. It means reforming the structural reforms to focus on the really important things, like what to do about uh, the oligarchs, uh, how to get a, a banking system that really provides SME lending rather than connected lending to the media. Uh, the big reforms, not the kinds of reforms that the Troika has been focusing on, they're debating issues, you know, the country is in depression, and they're debating how long uh, milk can be on the shelf and still be called fresh milk. Joseph Stiglitz, I know that you have a very busy schedule here in Paris. So I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to us at uh, France 24. I also want to thank ESCP Business School for hosting us here in central Paris. And thank you as well at home for watching. And do stay with us. We have more news coming your way soon.